Hello, everybody. Welcome in. It's Tuesday, and that means Okta, where we look at like on chain data, technical analysis a little bit, but also cover a whole bunch of news in technical analysis a little bit the good, bad, and the ugly. So let's jump right in. And it's kind of weird what's going on right now. You think the sky is actually falling, but it is in some areas, but not in others. And uh, I'm here to ground you all in data and reality as we go forward. So let's see, it's Tuesday. Uh, crypto market cap is 1.1 trillion or just shy of it. Uh, volume about 40 billion. Ethereum, 16.50, and Bitcoin at 27.400. I did tweet last night that that is a critical level to hold. We dipped below it, but it's holding real strong. And how did we know that was an important level? Well, it's in the models. So that's why. Um, now, fear and greed is at 50, which is actually really good too, because people aren't terrified, because they're veterans. Anyway, this, is, uh, this one is, of course, not financial advice, it's edutainment. And don't forget to subscribe if you want to get smarter. It's that simple. Um, so first of all, we start with the good news. And the story today is actually interesting. It's about sell pressure and what's going to happen in the future. Very exciting. It's not the negative sell pressure that you imagine. We'll talk about another type of sell pressure towards the end of the show too. But good news, fear and greed is up to 50 from 46. Not bad, considering if you ask any people on Twitter, they'll tell you it's the end of the world. But that's just Twitter. It's a weird microcosm. Uh, let's look at the market divided by Bitcoin over the last seven days. Very interesting. Solana's up over 20% for the week. Matic beat Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin Cash beat Bitcoin. I'll talk about Bitcoin Cash as well later. Um, but the rest is kind of red, including Ethereum. So a mixed week. Let's look at the dollar values because we always like to look at both to give that proper perspective. Over the last seven days, Bitcoin's up 4% to 27,400, let's call it. Ethereum, 3.86%. Uh, and other names, you can see 24% for Solana. Um, Rune is also up hard as well for the week, which is pretty good. And that's kind of the crypto market. Now, stock market last seven days as well, not bad. NVIDIA had a huge bounce back, up over 6%. Microsoft, green slightly. Google, up a little bit. Meta, up a little bit. Meta was the star of the show in September, as you may recall. Tesla, up just shy of 2%, despite what people thought were horrific, horrific Q3 production numbers, despite the fact that it's been telegraphed. Anyway, it's just, it fascinates me the way the human mind works. That's why we do this. So let's look at some crypto stats before we jump into deeper dives. Market cap, 1.1 trillion. Users up 4% in the last 24 hours to 5.5 million. Transactions up 10.5%, called it 11%, uh, to 35 million. Big move compared to last week. It's interesting. The actual market cap is up, but the users are down because last week it was 5.8%. 9 million users. You can see these are the 24 hour changes, but compared to last week, there's less users in the space, but a lot more transactions. Interesting to keep track of. Let's look and kind of to dig into the story today and why I'm really both excited and I have been excited for a long time. Uh, but this is from the team at Blockware Solutions. And it shows you Bitcoin price and issuance the 90 day moving average of issuance. That's the blue line in the top chart. Why do we care? Well, issuance is sell pressure. Also, you can see in the bottom of the chart, you've got the 90 day issuance changes and the 90 day issuance in dollars. So you have Bitcoin issuance and then the dollar value issuance. Now, as if you imagine somebody issues 10 Bitcoin, if the price is 10,000, that's the amount of issuance, 10 times 10,000. If the price of Bitcoin goes to 50,000, they're still issuing 10 Bitcoin, the dollar value goes up a lot more. But what I really want to get to and explain to everybody why this is so bullish is the dramatic reduction in daily sell pressure is expected to crash after the next halving. Track Bergeson, thank you so much. In 2020, the daily sell pressure dropped from $10 million a day of Bitcoin hitting the markets. In 2024, it's estimated to drop by $15 million a day. Of course, the price of Bitcoin is higher than it was in 2020. And if the Bitcoin price goes up, that amount of sell pressure is going to increase as well. 
And this is a significant decrease in the amount of Bitcoin hitting the market, and this will have a positive impact on price. Now, one way to think about it is that the miners are the largest sources of all sell pressures. Yes, the miners are getting hammered today, but they are the ones that need to sell their Bitcoin to cover their costs, such as electricity and hardware. Now, after the halving, the miners will be selling a lot less Bitcoin, which will reduce the overall sell pressure dramatically. And as long as the demand stays steady, the price will go up. In fact, we'll look at some on-chain data as well for the miners and what they're up to. But before I do that, people are freaked out as well about the dollar index. It's like, oh, dollar index up 12 days in a row. What are we going to do? Let's just look at some perspective. For the record, everybody is freaking out by the dollar strength. But remember, I keep saying this, the, the Dixie is a piece of poop compared to other turds out there. So it's meaningless. It's the least stinky turd, let's call it. And uh, everybody's freaking out. So if we go back to year-to-date data, and we can see, yes, the dollar index is up 3.49% against a basket of other currencies, like the Canadian dollar, the Swiss franc, the Swedish krona, the British pound, the euro, etc. The yen, <laughs> we know the yen has just completely tanked. In fact, they get to do some yield curve control to bring it back to 150 to the dollar. And anybody who's traded dollar yen for a long time will know it's normally about 100 maybe 110, <laughs> not up at 150. Anywho, that shows you exactly what the dollar is competing against. It's like going to a boxing match, competing against folks with their arms tied behind their back. They're not going to, they're going to do very well. But what the key point, even though the Dixie, anywhere you look at this chart, yeah, it peaked up, but Bitcoin is up 64.34% to date, despite the Dixie being up. So it doesn't really matter. And the bottom piece as well, is the Dixie divided by Bitcoin, and that's down 37%. So just for some perspective of what all this all means, don't let it shake you out of the market. Oh, the dollar's too strong, therefore I'm not going to invest right now. <sighs> anyway, moving on, let's look at minor reserves. Uh, we see this, in fact, you see this in the results, CleanSpark, I think their hodl bag is now 2,200 Bitcoin. They went from kind of selling all the Bitcoin that they could to buy rigs to scale up during the bear. Now they're flipped to a hodl strategy. And this is a chart from the top and bottom uh, indicator that we have, and it has a whole bunch of on-chain data in it. Now, I want to point out two big green arrows on this chart. Uh, first happened back in late April 2023. That's the turning point for when miners stop selling all their Bitcoin and they start increasing their reserves. And you can see they did that up until basically the 25th of June, then they stopped, then they started selling again. Notice as well the correlation with price. They accumulate sometimes when Bitcoin is cheap and they sell when it's expensive. Now, even though the price is higher than when they started selling last time, they started to accumulate again. Not much, but some of the clever miners are beginning to hodl because they know the sell pressure is going to be halved. They know it because they're the ones that create a lot of the sell pressure. They know the price will go up. So if they can manage cost and not sell their Bitcoin, they'll do better in the future. And we're seeing a lot of that happen. That's why I'm very excited for April. In fact, April 17th is the day we're all looking at. Bitcoin halving clock is 196 days away, ladies and gentlemen. That goes fast. It's just over half a year. Not much, and it'll be here before you know it. Let's look at some uh, old coins and Bitcoin over the last fifth, last week and the last 30 days. This is from our crypto compendium. You can see where Bitcoin stacks up over the last seven days in the top chart and all the names that outperformed it. So BSV, <laughs> we'll talk about them in a minute too. Solana, Rune, Arbitrum, Bitcoin Cash, and Aave were the top six over the last 30 day, uh, over the last week. And over the last 30 days, it was BSC, Rune, Maker, Aave, Chainlink, and Solana. We'll also be talking about Chainlink as well. I get a ton of requests. Please do another, should I buy for Chainlink? Let me know below if you want me to do that. Uh, a lot of people are hungry for my current thoughts on Chainlink. I, right now, I don't own any, but... Uh, there's a lot of good press coming, and you'll see about that in a minute. So I listen to all the comments when people ask me to do stuff uh, in Patreon. So this is the alt season index. We're back down to 39. Last week I did this, we were 55. And you can see here, it's kind of crazy. It's very volatile. But uh, 
we monitor that very carefully. Now the other 90 days, we did the week, we did the 30 days. Now we're looking at the 90 days compared to Bitcoin. And you can see the winners are names like XDC, Maker, Solana, Chainlink, Tron, XLM, Optimism, XRP is there as well, and a few others. So you can see Bitcoin is kind of getting stronger. It had a crazy good weekend that we saw reflected in the numbers I just showed you as well. But it's coming back down to earth, but it's hanging close around that 27,400 level. Now let's look at money flow, a key part of Tuesdays. We follow the money. And as forecast last week, I did say exactly a week ago, because the trend was going up, I expected a positive inflow this week, and that's what happened. And for the first time in six weeks, there was a $21 million inflow into digital asset funds. Remember, just so people know, this is a digital asset funds across Europe and South America, North America, etc., Canada. It does not incorporate how much people are buying or selling. It's just fund flows in and out of actual digital asset funds. Let's look at the breakdown here. Uh, you can see Bitcoin had 20 million flow in. That was the majority of the inflows, while outflows continue in the short Bitcoin, which sold one and a half million last week. By the way, I think I can't remember where I shared it, maybe on Patreon, but a huge amount of option action on Bitcoin uh, for 45K by Christmas. A lot of people are placing their bets. They believe Bitcoin could hit 45,000 by Christmas. I think that's a bit bullish, but you know, we'll see if these options traders are correct. But uh, outflows have been down $85 million from the short Bitcoin fund since April, which is good. When people start taking their shorts off the table, that's a bullish sign. Now, there was very little activity seen in the altcoin space, with one exception. Yes, I'll say it. Why not? Solana continues to shine. Inflows of 5 million. Now, that doesn't sound like a lot, but we'll wait till you see the next chart. But this is the 27th week of inflows. And they just had four weeks of outflows this year. And those outflows were very slight. And it's highlighting, again, the most loved altcoin this year. And that's also reflected in its relative performance against Ethereum, against Cardano, against any other asset you pick. It has done very, very well. Now, let's break this down because you can see all the money. I always say follow the money because that tells you where the smart money is pumping money. Let's look at the breakdown of what this actually means. So I took the assets under management across all these different assets. The weekly flows are there and the year-to-date flows. And I calculated the year-to-date flow as a percentage of asset under management. And you can see here so far, the amount of net new money into Solana wins at 36.9%. Cardano is number two at 24%. So the year-to-date inflows are 6 million and the AUM is now 25 million. The year-to-date inflows into Solana are 31 million, then more than 5x what went into Cardano. The total funds is 84 million. And you can see some of the changes as well. Tron had a huge amount of drainage. Uh, year-to-date flows are minus 51 million. So it can cut both ways, everybody. But Tron itself has been on fire lately too. But sometimes assets top out. XRP has also had a pretty good year. Uh, year-to-date flows of about 22%. Uh, I still scratch my head about that one, but I don't like inflation, whether it's in fiat or stock dilution or token inflation. I don't like it uh, because that also drives sell pressure. And that's what the story is about today. Let's move on. Uh, Chainlink, great news here for Chainlink. And this is why we got to do something about Chainlink. But it, only if you're interested, drop a comment below. We made, and uh, that's a South Korean gaming titan. And gaming is huge. I've never played video games, but I know it's a big industry. Uh, this They want to utilize Chainlink's cross-chain interoperability protocol, CCIP, to power its Unagi omnichain ecosystem. So gamers are going hard into blockchain. This is super, super important. And their ecosystem aims to integrate and enable seamless interactions between blockchains like Solana, Ethereum, Polygon, Arbitrum, Binance, Optimism, Avalanche, etc., to promote their web adoption. And security and integration, they chose CCIP because of its strong security features, especially threats to cross-chain protocols. We always talk about bridges and how bridges are risky, but maybe CCIP has the secret to that to make them safe. So this is a big, big, big news as well. And I think Chainlink are also part of their vision and they've been inducted into their organization, the WeMade organization to, I guess it's kind of like a DAO or something. 
I don't have to dig more into that, but that is big news for Chainlink. Now let's look at the top three winners and losers. Last week, another view of the world. BSV is number one, up 30% over the last week. What is going on there? But year to date, down 3%. Solana up 27% over the last week. Year to date, up 141%. Uh, Rune up 18%. Year to date, up 54%. And the loser, uh, Ton down 6 Aptos and XLM all flat. And when, when you have the market overall going up over the last seven days and you're flat, that's considered a ding. That's not bad, but it's also not too bad if you're holding this. Let's look at the top three last week. The big names, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Binance. Bitcoin up 5%, Ethereum up 5%, slightly less than Bitcoin, and Binance up only 2%. Still at that magical 215 layer, which is key to them because if they tank below 210 or 205, there is some type of liquidation in place. So that is the good crypto news for now. Before we get to the ugly stuff, this is um, Tesla trailing 12-month deliveries on the right-hand side. And you can see, just for perspective, if you take into account the 12-month deliveries, that means it includes Q3, Q2, Q1, and Q4 from 2022 to get to this number, you see what we call an S-curve. So I tried to put together a picture of a bridge signifying vehicles and how it's like an S-curve, and that's the best thing I could do. Thank you, AI, for making that possible. Tesla is still smashing it, but it's going to get a lot better. This is Tesla versus Toyota again. Toyota is the biggest selling car maker on the planet. Now, in the United States, Tesla just re released a new Model Y starting at $43,990, and that means you can buy it for $35,990 after the $7,500 federal tax credit and a $500 referral discount. And that puts the affordability of the Model Y in perspective. This is the cheapest Toyota RAV4 Prime in my area, okay? It's $52,004, right? I mean, these, these things are just very, 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 very different in terms of price. And if you step into a RAV4, and then you step into a Model Y, it's like going from a traditional car that burns gas, like getting into a spaceship. And that's just reality. Who would buy a RAV4 right now? Craziness. Anyway, in other news, uh, our newsletter, um, 12 cents a day, $45 a year. It's action-packed. I should call it the, uh, the Pathway to financial freedom but a big thank you to our community writers that do this every single day and punch them out and it's about 12 cents a day per newsletter packed with information because i go very fast in my videos and i don't waste your time but guess what invest answers is already a top 100 sub stack only after a couple of months which blew me away thank you for letting me know i don't i didn't even know there was a ranking or a listing so it is definitely worthwhile doomberg is number one we're coming for you only kidding we're not competitive but anyway, that's the uh, newsletter if you want to catch. If you don't have time to watch a 25-minute, 30-minute video, you can read all of the nuggets in five minutes every day. The bad news, everybody. Let's go. Some ugly stuff. It was a very underwhelming ETH futures ETF demand, which doesn't bode well for ETH. This is the list from K33. The ProShares ETH and VanEx EFUET, EFUD almost, attracted the highest daily trading volumes, but it all happened within the first minute of the actual asset going live. A massive 49% of daily volume occurred in the first trading 60 seconds. And that was it. <laughs> After that, it was quiet as crickets. From then on, ProShares uh, saw the most activity and ETH saw the highest launch day volume among the ETH. But to put things in perspective, EETH is winning, EFUT, etc. You can see they're all kind of nothing burgers. But how this compares to Beto, ETH futures is kind of dead on arrival. Only, only $7.4 million of volume. Compare that to when Beto launched, it was $571 million. And I'm adding all of those ETFs together. And I'm comparing them just to one Bitcoin future ETF. So that is a very, very stark contrast. Not good. But remember as well, I always say, be careful with futures. This is the Beto chart, uh, and it sucks hard. And I love this. Uh, please take my money. I use the same meme twice over the weekend in the Q&A. But Beto is down 23.32% versus Bitcoin year to date. Pair charts, everything is a pair, everybody. 
always measure your asset against another asset. And that is stunning. If you're holding Beto, it's a losing strategy. Be careful out there. You can get in for a quick trade for two or three weeks. That's it. Then get out. You'll be eaten alive by Contango, which we've covered as well. But that chart was kind of startling to me. And again, if you're thinking of buying a Ethereum futures ETF, <laughs> the same thing will happen. Now, speaking of discounts, here we have Grayscale um, discount over Bitcoin. It's 21.26 right now. And the ETH discount over ETH is 30.72%. Now, two weeks ago, it was exactly 21. So the GBTC discount has not changed in the last two weeks. And the uh, ETH discount has also not changed. Uh, it's kind of bizarre. It's like the excitement of these things converting to a spot has diminished. And I still expect a spot ETF to launch sometime in 2024, hopefully Q1, probably Q1 because the big BlackRock moneymaker shop does not want to get in after the halving, especially because of the sell pressure is going to diminish and that's going to drive the price up. And that's just economics 101. Let's look at Bitcoin NASDAQ correlation here as well. You can see NASDAQ is down 1% over the last 90 days and Bitcoin is down 13%. Despite a good week last week. Thank you all as well for the likes and support and to the mods in the chat, TND, Tesla, and everybody else. And Mr. Hammer, thank you all for coming. Now, ugly news, seatbelts on, please. I wish I should get one of those little airplane buckle things and do the sign because there's some terrifying news coming. Uh, let's look at this. Don't be fooled by BSV. BSV stands for Bitcoin Strategic Vision. It is down 95% against Bitcoin in the BSV USD pair. If you hold BSV and you think it's Bitcoin, it's not. And these results will speak, speak to it. It's got a zombie coefficient of minus two, which is extremely bad as well. And uh, yeah, do not, do not, do not hold cheap imitations. I always say pure form, everybody. Same thing for, you know, other names too. So despite BSV and everything being hot, people tend to FOMO into things that rise a lot in a week and they get excited but over time, they'll get hammered, and that's just the reality. And speaking of this, too, and first of all, I love our Australians and our Australians in the audience. They're the coolest people in the world. But there is one fellow called Craig Wright, who is Australian, and they call him Fake Toshi. He pretends to be Satoshi Nakamoto. But per Forbes, saying all this allegedly, per Forbes, not me, just an opinion from Forbes, uh, Craig Wright <laughs> could be doomed. A shocking leak blows up the mystery of Bitcoin creator Satoshi Nakamoto. Craig Wright's claims and recent developments, he is an Australian computer scientist, and he's been at the forefront of claiming to be Satoshi Nakamoto for years. He is suing everybody left, right, and center um, in the UK and other places. But a recent re leak reveals that one of his major supporters might be losing faith in his claim. His name is Kristen Agar Hansen. He's the former Enchain CEO, and he quit BSV Infrastructure Company, and he's going to leak emails suggesting that Calvin Ayer, who has been heavily backed the company, doesn't believe Wright is Satoshi Nakamoto. Again, for years, I've said this probably since the year 2028, if Craig Wright wants to prove he is Satoshi Nakamoto, he just needs to move one Bitcoin from the 1.04 million wallet. That's it, just one. He just goes on Twitter and said, maybe you do a Twitter live show. It's like, hey, I am Satoshi. Let me prove to you. I'm going to move one Bitcoin right now for my 1.04 million stash. And then we'd all believe. But the fact that he doesn't have the courage to do that because he's not Satoshi. Well, good on Forbes for reporting that, actually. Uh, let's look at the reigning tokens news, the big unlocks this week. And uh, not too much, actually, but the usual suspects are always there. IMX. Glimmer, Aptos, and Sweatcoin, they continue to rain on the poor retail investors. Again, story today is about sell pressure. This is the ugly sell pressure. You do not want to be on the receiving end of, okay? You want sell pressure to go down. You don't want it to rain on you every single week because then there'll never be any price appreciation. Pull up an Aptos, put up any chart for any of these tokens, whether it's Sweat or... IMX or Glimmer or Aptos, and you'll see what raining tokens does to price action. Now, another ugly downward looking chart, everybody. This is US Strategy. 
the U.S., the United States now has 17, 17 days left of oil in what they call the SPR. That's Strategic Petroleum Reserves. And this is according to Reuters. That is kind of scary. That is half the historical average of about 35 days dating back to 1990. The problem is they should have refilled this tank when the price was $60 a barrel. I mentioned that here on the channel. That is the time to buy. Now with price above 90, it's a lot more expensive to do so. Uh, prices have gone up 30, 35% on the last couple of weeks. And that will hurt refilling them, especially with all the other expenses that the U.S. has right now. Now, tomorrow there is an OPEC meeting that kicks off to discuss ongoing production cuts. And they really want to squeeze and so-called have the U.S. government over a barrel. But this, this is a dangerous situation. Uh, so the U.S. needs to figure this out pretty soon. Or else, imagine, imagine a situation where the U.S. has to go to war. Hyper, oh, heaven forbid that ever happens. Well, I'm not going to get involved in that. I shouldn't have mentioned that. But there, there'd be no oil to run the machinery, the war machine. So that's that's kind of part of why it's called a strategic oil reserve. Speaking of over a barrel, China is dumping, dumping U.S. Treasuries hand over fist. And why do we care? Okay, the red line here is China and the amount of treasuries is falling down to $821 billion or I think that is. And why, why do we care? Well, what does this mean for rates? So when China sells U.S. Treasuries, it increases the supply of U.S. Treasuries on the market. And this drives down the price of U.S. Treasuries and has to push up their yields because nobody's going to buy this unless they juice the return. And conversely, when China buys Treasuries, it decreases the supply of Treasuries in the market, which drives up the price and pushes down their yields. Nobody is buying U.S. Treasuries except perhaps Japan. Japan there is a little yellow slight tick up. Maybe they are. But China has been selling U.S. Treasuries since 2021 at a very fast rate. And the pace has accelerated in recent months. They want to get away from all dollar denominated assets, all Treasuries, as quickly as they can. And this is impacting rates right now. Let's look at some yield curve inversion. Uh, this time is very different. We have never had such a long-term inverted yield curve in the history of the United States. If you go back to when it is inverted, you got the 1980s recession, you got the dot-com bust, you got the GFC, you got the 2020 recession, and we have today. And it's ugly, but it's okay, because I, I worry about Jay Powell. He, he looks a bit weathered, but he's on some social platform. I think he's on Instagram now or TikTok or something doing videos, which is like, what? <laughs> I'm not even going to go there. But this is the scariest chart today. This is in Bitcoin advertising news, Debt Mageddon. Shout out to James Lavish. He just tweeted this right before I went live. Since the creation of the Fed in 1913, U.S. federal debt has on average doubled every six, seven, eight to nine years. But right now, it's accelerating. I keep on talking about this other S-curve. We like S-curves, but not for debt. Nope. We like them for things like Tesla and adoption of Bitcoin. Yes, but not for this. So approximately by 2036, U.S. debt will be $100 trillion. I've shared similar kind of graphics. 2036 is not too far away, 12, 13 years away. And inflation and interest cycles are pointing up for another 20 to 30 years. And rates could be. 10% in 2036. Again, going back to what I said before, nobody's going to buy a treasury when they know the dollar is being debased so fast. They'll want a big return for it in order to buy it. And if nobody buys the debt, everything implodes. And that's a debt crisis, credit crunch, whatever you want to call. Um, now, 10% on 100 trillion is 10 trillion in interest expense. And it's going to be uh, well north of 1 trillion in interest expense already in 2023. Higher spending, lower tax revenue, equals budget deficit to $10 trillion. I cover this time and time again, and it is terrifying. All right? That is why, everybody, do not hold dollars in your account. Stick them in something hard, okay? Very, very important. With that, everybody, thank you all for coming. Big thank you to everybody on Patreon. Hit the likes on the way out, and uh, hope you enjoy the show. Thank you. Only do 2,000 people watching live. Love each and every one of you. It is a tough world, exactly, TND tells that. And it's going to get a lot uglier. 
And I'm here to share, again, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And sorry about the grief tidings, everybody. Have a great day. See you tomorrow.